Disclosure, this video is sponsored by the free-to-play game World of Warships. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster for inviting me. In this video we look at why the Germans did not produce a mine clearing tank similar to the German Crab or the British Matilda Scorpion. So a Panzer that was equipped with a flail system. If you know already, there's a bit of a spoiler alert in the picture, but the Germans tried various the mechanical and also explosive devices as well. Here you can see some of the explosive devices. They tried mine rollers and they know that they have serious issues. For instance, the tanks were hard to steer and at the same time the rollers were rather in the front and close by so they both endangered the tanks, so especially the tracks, but also the crew inside. So they, they put two in front and one afterwards to clear also the area that was not covered by the, by the rollers in front, by the track. They had various other vehicles as well that tried similar. They also tried um, detonation cord nets. So basically to have a net that then explodes. Now before we look into the other methods the Germans tried, a short word about the sponsor of this video, the free-to-play game World of Warships, which is available on PC and consoles as well. Fight it out in 12 12 12 arenas. Download World of Warships for free. Just click on the first link in the description. This also supports the channel. Be sure to use the promo code BRAVO during registration to receive the following freebies. 500 doublons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time and a free ship. World of Warships undergoes continuous updates, receiving new ships, cosmetics and themed content such as Megadeth and Azur Lane collaborations. It is a massive game with over 40 maps offering dynamic weather and stunning effects. The game provides a diverse range of experiences. You can adopt various tactics based on ship classes, whether you prefer a swift and stealthy approach, employing your destroyer armed with a barrage of torpedoes or an open combat style with a hefty broadside from your battleship. Of course, you can also use carriers, cruisers and even submarines. The game boasts an extensive fleet encompassing over 600 ships, including renowned vessels like the Prinz Eugen, the Shukaku, the USS Iowa and HMS Ark Royale. Now back to the various other mine clearing vehicles the Germans tried. Probably the most, the, the biggest ones they tried were the Alcat Räumer and the Krupp Räumer. These were huge vehicles. The Alcat Räumer is basically has three large, really large elements that could explode a mine out of steel and not, uh, not destroy it. And it was, it's now in Kubinka, it's a huge vehicle. And the Krupp Räumer was even larger. It was wheeled. And as far as I know, it disappeared. So it was quite funny because it's a huge vehicle. And one of the last pictures I think is from somewhere in, in France where there was one part on a train and then it seems to have been lost to history. But there were various also minor developments before. So early on in 1940, they had small tanks, something in between those two. And they had also mine rollers, but in the back. So these were used to destroy anti-personal mines. But the problem is they ran down on anti-tank mines and then were exploded and they were not particularly happy. Also, these already were able to carry explosives. And this is one important issue I see and I think it is one of, one of the important factors why the Germans didn't develop a Sherman Crab in that sense. They went for a multi-purpose solution, it seems, from the very beginning. From the very beginning, they want something to clear mines but also destroy mines with explosives and or fortified positions or, or bridges or something else. And this would be in line with other requirements for the Germans, for instance, here we are next to the Hummel, which is a um, self-propelled artillery. And they early on, they wanted for a very long time that the turret or basically the gun could be completely detached, but also be usable as well. And this you see in several other instances as well that they just want maybe a bit too much. I must add here, I didn't find a, a definitive answer. So that one, I didn't find a document that said, okay, we tried this and this and this and it didn't work. Now later on, around 44, the Germans tried to also use a flail system. And it's interesting, there's a remark from Krupp and they state, 
we already tried this and the French already tried this. This didn't work. Why are you going to try it again? This gets even more odd, since the British Matilda tank with flail system was already used in 1942 in North Africa. Yet according to Jens and Doyle, the Germans learned about this in 1944 from a British propaganda leaflet. To quote, Waffenprüf 5, the Department for Combat and Fortress Engineers in the Army Weapons Agency, learn of the design of a mine clearing flail mounted on a tank from British propaganda leaflets which bragged that this invention had already been successfully employed in Africa as well as recently on the invasion front. On 10th August 1944, Waffenprüf 5 informed Krupp the preparations were already underway for preliminary trials of a similar device which had been ordered by Hitler. Krupp noted that years earlier the Waffenamt had made a similar attempt but without any success and also that the French attempts had not been successful. Now the Matilda Scorpion had various drawbacks, so let's take a short look at it. The British already, at least um, in the desert, tried a flail system and with more or less success, the Matilda Scorpion. So the Scorpion was, it was an additional engine that was attached to the side of the tank and there was a guy in using it. And then it was further developed and the Americans finally built the Sherman flail that hadn't a, an additional engine mounted on it and definitely not another guy because there's a picture of this shown in the video from the tank museum and it's a rather uncomfortable spot. Like it's a, a small box on the outside of the Matilda tank and the guy is sitting in there. I think. So it seems the chairman tried also a flail system, but besides that one remark, I didn't find any. For the mechanical or various mine clearing tank approaches, there are around eight. One is also like a, a changed pencil free chassis it's basically like if you put a Panzer free and you make everything two times higher. So it's really a really high chassis, it looks rather odd. And I think there's only a handful of photos exist of it. And it was also equipped with mine rollers. So I saw one picture where you just see the chassis and there's another picture when with, uh, with the mine rollers attached. Now if I don't show the pictures here, it's usually because of copyright. Now the German Panzer General Munzel also noted in his book about the armored troops of the Germans, mine clearing tanks with mine clearing rollers, which was intended to absorb the mine blast effect. This roller therefore had to be heavy so that the tank suffered in its cross country mobility. The tests were abandoned. Another test, which was not carried out further, involved throwing stretched charges from the tank into the roadway by spring force. During the war, Oscillating devices were also developed that were pushed by tanks and had little effect on off-road mobility. Here a hammer mechanism was intended to cause the mines to detonate by vibration. This is also mentioned by Jens, this vehicle, about the stretch charges I assume here refers to the detonation coordinates, but it could also be something else. Now interestingly enough, today mine clearing is done with stretch charges that have shot several hundreds of meters and detonate. Now if we look at the organizational history, it's actually quite interesting because they start around in June 1940 with a mine clearing company, which then gets extended to a mine clearing battalion in December 1940. And then subsequently at one point it's renamed into a tank battalion. And finally it's basically in a con uh, called a radio controlled tank battalion. So you can see in the organizational name that it changed from mine clearing to something else, to one, what, something more general purpose. We also need to look at the experience report for Kursk where these mine clearing tanks or explosive radio control tanks were used for mine clearing. Now the report stated although two companies were used that there were still a lot of uses, a lot of losses due to mines and but also the problem was that the, in the assembly area, the mine control tanks were hit, so they sustained very losses there. They were able to clear lanes, but the problem was the lanes through the minefield still had to be marked by the combat engineers and they were not able to do this. So as such, they recommended that both the, the demolition tanks need to be improved, but also that there must be better protection against artillery and something else to use these vehicles effectively. 
Besides improving these tanks, they also called in the experience report for the development of mine rollers. And this is very interesting because the, in the report, the mine roller is marked with a question mark. So it seems the person that read this report likely was not aware about these tests or what is meant at all. Now we also need to talk a bit about the Sherman Crab. Now, if you see the Sherman Crab and you think, well, that's a perfect solution, it just destroys mines and everything is fine. This is not necessarily the case. It was a very effective way to clear mines, but the problem is, like with all breaching equipment, you need to suppress the enemy. You, you need to suppress all the anti-tank weapons that can attack the tank. The tank is very slow. The Sherman flail also had to, or Sherman crab had to turn the turret to the side or backwards, else it might have damaged the turret, uh, or the gun especially. They were else, the guns were usable, but not when the flail system was in action. So the tank also moved rather slowly ahead, so it could not use its full speed. During D, they were very effective, and I asked Chifton a bit, and he said, there's a, the one main problem was terrain. In some terrains, these worked very well, in some terrains, less so. One aspect with the Sherman Crab is also, if we compare the German and the US experience, the Americans used a medium tank chassis as, uh, as base, whereas the Germans always went more with these cheap, smaller tanks. Now this is both probably due to, well, they are cheaper and they have less available, but also the German industry was structured very differently. So you had like some companies that could construct larger tanks, but some they could only construct smaller tanks. The best example for this is the Jagdpanzer 38, generally known as the Hetzer. It was basically produced because they couldn't build Sturk 3 there. So this was a bit of a, a difference where you can see, so these were generally produced by Borgward, and I assume that Borgward was not capable of producing like a Sherman at all or, or a Panzer IV and then put a, a flail on it. Now we also have the doctrine from 1944 how to use these radio controlled demolition tanks and they note several missions how they can be used. They don't use just a mine clearing. They specifically note they can be used for recon so to find out basically where the minefields, where is the enemy because the enemy will start shooting at such a tank. Additionally to also use it to basically scout the area and how is it usable for tanks. Because these are also tracked vehicles, of course they are not as heavy, but they can give you a basic idea how the terrain is, is to be able, can it be driven with a tracked vehicle or not. Now the other main mission besides recon was a high explosive carrier and here they for, note four targets, basically mines and obstacles first, then fortifications, then anti-tank defenses, and then also bridges and important major structures. And finally, they also mentioned that they can be used for smoke deployment, something which makes a lot of sense, because if you can stuck explosives into it, you can also uh, put smoke grenades or something else into it. Although I don't know how often this was used. Additionally, the manual mentions that it's required that proper artillery or naval warfare support is provided specifically against observation posts and defensive weapons. And they also note the minimum distances for friendly troops to stay away. So for tanks, it's at least 75 meters. For Panzergrenadier without cover, it's 500 and in cover, it's 150 meters. And another aspect that they mentioned that they can be used to attack heavy tanks. And they specifically mentioned if you attack heavy tanks, use two tanks simultaneously. So to conclude, why didn't the Germans have a Sherman Crab or a Sherman Flail, however you want to call it, or a Panzer Flail? Well, I think there are several points here. First, I think one aspect is that the Germans in this case tried to go for a multi-purpose solution due to limited resources and or to overcomplicate everything, probably a mixture of both, so that you have this tank that can deploy explosive but also create holes in minefields and maybe deploy smoke and use it for recon as well. Because the other tank you can mainly use as a regular tank and for firing, but it's a bit overpriced for that and then for clearing mines. The other thing is that also a Sherman Crab in 
such a situation is rather vulnerable to enemy fire, but that is nearly every vehicle. And these, you could say, they were more expendable, especially since they were radio controlled, than a Sherman Crab. Now the other thing is, these are also cheap and easier to produce and also can be produced by industries that could not produce full-blown tanks. Here again, the example of the Hetzer. The factory couldn't produce a Stück free, but it could produce the Hetzer. So the Jagdpanzer 38 was produced. So overall, the Germans also tried various mechanical solutions and they were apparently not really happy with them. There's these huge vehicles, which I find completely unsuitable due to the size and everything to use them under fire, like the Alcat Räumer or the Group S Räumer. And so it was not like they went immediately with this. It seems like this was for them at the time the best solution. The other aspect is, of course, after Kursk, there was no ma major German offensive anymore. So mine clearing was less of an issue as well. So less resources probably were put into this. And as again, I guess this also led to a more focus on, on these explosive carriers because, well, you can use them in, in many ways. And so they are multi-purpose. And the other thing would have cost too much to develop for, for an importance that's not needed. Of course, we also know that they tried in 1944 to create a flail tank. So it's, it's a bit of a counterbalance, but this is always the problem. You have like one hand doesn't know what the other is sometimes doing. I hope you learned something new. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster for inviting me. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye. Don't forget to download World of Warships for free. Just click on the first link in the description. This also helps the channel. Be sure to use the promo code BRAVO during registration to receive the following freebies. 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time and a free ship. Thank you to the free to play game World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster for inviting me. See you next time.